Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to Origin and Causes webinar titled Residential Oil Spills, a Messy Business. My name is George Castandi and I'll be the moderator today. We have an exciting webinar prepared for you all. I just want to go through uh, a couple of uh, quick pointers with you first. If you've joined us through your computer to see the slides, you'll notice the GoToWebinar console on the top right corner of your uh, webinar screen. So through that little console, there's a question feature there. I've, I've put a little uh, arrow to show you right over here. That's where you can submit your questions. I really encourage you guys to uh, submit questions whenever you think of one. Just throw it up there and we will try to get to them uh, at the very end. We have a 15 minute Q&A uh, scheduled at the very end. And don't miss it because it's usually very exciting. A lot of people really enjoy the Q&As. Um, all the questions will be anonymously addressed unless you wish to your identity to actually be uh, ident or mentioned. So if you want your name to be mentioned, just put your name, put your company, and then uh, your question or your comment, and, and we'll give you a shout out. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible depending on how much time is left over at the end of the presentation. But if we don't get to your question in the webinar, we promise to follow up with you after the fact and make sure that your questions or your comments are, are answered. If you're calling in and you have any questions, please email us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. If you need like any support issues or whatever, send us an email, we'll, we'll be able to help you out right away. And of course, join in on the conversation on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at origin underscore cause and uh, hashtag OC webinar. All right, so I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Dina Matei who is a consulting forensic engineer with over 20 years of experience, specialized in metallurgical materials and mechanical failure analysis. He's completed over a thousand forensic investigations of various metallic and non-metallic components, and he's been qualified in court as an expert witness. Today we also have Adam Grant joining us from McCaig Borlack. He is a partner at McCaig Borlack, specializing in subrogation, uh, including fire, uh, fire losses, uh, floods, environmental contamination, uh, losses, and so on. He represent, represents insurers as well as public authorities such as TSSA and has conducted numerous trials and appeals for trials uh, for clients. So I'll pass on the mic to Adam now and we'll get right to it. Thanks, George. And thanks everyone for joining us. Um, first, we're going to talk about what our oil spill exposure is. According to Statistics Canada, there's about 7.3 million single detached homes in Canada. About 14% of those use f fuel oil for heating. Uh, most of those are rural, but there's a surprising number still in cities that you wouldn't think about. Toronto, even for being as urban as it is, still has a number of fuel oil tanks in, in operation. Uh, there's a little over a million residential fuel oil tanks in Canada, and half a million of those tanks are in Ontario, according to the TSSA. So the consequences of uh, residential oil spills, the first and most obvious one is uh, the environmental contamination. So fuel oil seeps into the soil as when in, well in, into any other permeable substance such as concrete. Uh, once the fuel oil is in the soil, it can infiltrate the groundwater and get carried along to various other water sources. As we all know, the longer it gets left there, the further it spreads and the more areas it can infiltrate. Uh, property damage is another well understood consequence of oil spills, especially for uh, insurers, though it's usually more directed at interior tanks. As the fuel oil leaks out of the tank, it'll permeate any surfaces that it's able to, including wood, concrete, and drywall, which are the three primary components of residential homes. The oil also soaks into fabrics and textiles, and typically renders them a complete loss. Uh, in addition, fuel oil vapor can spread throughout the home, which damages a number of items which would otherwise not have any direct contact with the oil. Um, a little less known, fuel oil exposure can lead to some adverse health effects, though uh, these usually only arise when there's extended contact with the fuel oil or vapor, mostly with the interior tanks due to the enclosed spaces present. Uh, most often such health effects occur when a homeowner tries to spend a significant amount of time trying to mitigate a loss immediately after a spill. Usually they'll, they'll hang around the basement trying to collect spilled oil into containers. Uh, in one of the cases I dealt with, the, the homeowner did just that. He came home to discover a leak in his tank. He spent the night capturing the oil. Uh, it ultimately led to a lot of respiratory problems. He was hospitalized for it, and it, it did actually contribute to his death in the end. 
Now, most familiar to home insurers, the cost of remediation of fuel oil spills seems to have been increasing quite a bit lately. Even a small remediation we're finding nowadays is usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, remediation of the fuel oil spill can be kind of a complicated endeavor as you're trying to conduct testing to determine where the oil is spread, as well as you're actively taking steps to remove the contaminated soil and treat any contaminated water. Uh, this is all performed in an environment where the oil is constantly moving and spreading. Uh, in addition, depending on where and how the oil spreads, it may be necessary to structurally reinforce a structure, typically a house, uh, in order to excavate the contaminated soil underneath. This can add an engineering and construction cost to the remediation and testing, which are already quite high at that stage. And finally, litigation, of fuel, litigation costs of fuel oil claims have been steadily increasing over the years, especially as those remediation costs continue to go up. Uh, it's become more and more worthwhile for insurers to spend more money on counsel and experts in an attempt to try and reduce their exposures on claims and to drive the settlement values down. Uh, while this is obviously good for those defending insurers, it's quite bad for subrogating insurers as it means that not only are those settlement values coming down, which means you've got a, a lower percentage of recovery on your output, but the resolutions are also taking significantly longer to achieve. Uh, so now I'm going to pass the mic over to Dinu to talk about the types of oil tanks. Thanks, Adam, and welcome everyone to our webinar on oil spills. We will be covering oil spills associated with oil storage tank and inline filters. Oil spills from burners and or furnaces do occur, however, they will be covered in a separate webinar. Let's start this technical side of the webinar by presenting the types of residential fuel oil storage tanks that are currently in use throughout Canada. The most uh, common and counter residential oil tank is the vertical one. Oil tanks in Canada needs to be certified and they have to follow certain uh, regulations and they have to meet certain specifications. These specifications are included in a standard developed by Canadian Standard Association and the tanks are usually certified by underwriters laboratories. There are a few, a few configurations available, some being common, some being less encountered. This slide provides images of the most common encountered tank, the vertical one. On the left side in the slide, there is an example of a tank provided with an outlet port on the side, and there are also variations of the tanks which are provided with an outlet port located at the bottom. As it will be shown later, the design with the outlet port on the side is a design deficiency and is a primary cause for oil spills. On the right side on the slide, there is an example of a less common encountered vertical fuel oil storage tank, one with an outlet port or burner supply connection located on the top. Some oil storage tanks are designed to be installed horizontally, especially when they are installed indoors or in crawl spaces. Like the vertical ones, the, original, the horizontal tank, tanks are provided with an outlet port located either on the side or at the bottom. Installation of oil tanks in parallel or in series is permitted providing that the installation follows the requirements of the applicable codes. In Ontario, the handling and storage of fuel oil is, government, is governed under the Technical Standards and Safety Act, TSSA, under Ontario Regulation 213, and administered under Canadian Standard Association Standard B139, Ontario Installation Code for Oil Burning Equipment. This standard determines the specific requirements for the storage, handling, and utilization of the fuel oil. Due to increased number of oil spills from single wall tanks, as of November 9, 2012, according to an amendment issued by the TSSA, in Ontario, all the above ground tanks, both indoors and outdoors, must be installed with double bottom, double wall, or secondary containment. These tanks are provided with a bo double bottom and are equipped with a leak detector system. Some of these tanks are designed to take at least 100% of the capacity of the inner tank and will provide maximum protection in the case of a leak. Apparently, there are fiberglass approved for use in Canada. However, to this date, we were not involved in any oil spill associated with double wall tanks or fiberglass tanks. In the next uh, slides, we will uh, <coughs> excuse me, discuss a few common causes of oil spills. We are covering uh, oil spills occurring from a residential uh, oil storage tank. 
Unfortunately, we cannot cover all the causes. However, in the following slides, we will showcase some of the most common ones, and we will also discuss a few of less encountered. But before we go into the topic, let's start with a quick pop quiz. The question is, which of the following factors contributes to the corrosion of oil tanks? A, stagnant water at the bottom of the tank. B, protective coating inside the tank. C, muscles. Or D, diesel fuel. I'll give you 10 seconds to submit your answer, and then we'll go through the results together. Okay, the poll is now closed, and I'm uh, happy to let you know that 80% of the respondents provide the correct answer, which is A, stagnant water at the bottom of the tank. Coating inside the tank is designed to protect it from corrosion. We don't see muscles in the, inside the tanks, and diesel fuel is non-corrosive. Let's move on and discuss uh, some of the common oil spills. The most common one is a degradation mechanism due to the degradation mechanism called microbiologically induced corrosion, or in short, MIC. This degradation is due to water accumulated inside and at the bottom of the oil tanks. Water enters the tank uh, mostly be because of condensation. It forms actually inside the tank due to condensation. And in stagnant water containing organic material, which in includes diesel fuel, bacteria can thrive. In fact, microbial growth is always related to the presence of water. Diesel fuel is known to provide a source of nutrition for bacteria that is present. As corrosive compounds are released by bacteria inside the tank, the steel of the tank starts to be corroded from inside out until the bottom wall is eventually perforated. MIC is undetectable by visual examination from the outside. Usually, MIC is uh, determined by uh, more complicated techniques which are not covered in this uh, topic, and uh, the instruments used to detect MIC are usually not carried by oil suppliers. The image in this slide shows a close-up view of a bottom perforation of an oil tank as seen from the outside. As you can see, the hole is not visible because it's obscured by a layer of paint. In this particular case, it was the bulging of the paint that revealed the location of the hole at the bottom of the tank. Oftentimes, it's more than one uh, hole that can form at the bottom of the tanks. This slide shows a typical appearance of uh, bottom wall perforation as seen from the outside of the tank. As mentioned earlier, corrosion in uh, MIC starts inside the tank. This slide shows a very nice picture showing uh, severe pitting at the bottom of the tank, and those pits, holes in the me image, will eventually develop and will form a, a bottom hole perforation. The next slide shows a rare image obtained under a very powerful microscope called scanning electron microscope. The image is taken at a magnification of 3,500 times, and it shows actually a bacteria colony that was observed in one of the pits close to a bottom hole. MIC is caused by stagnant water accumulated at the bottom of the tank. Sometimes the design deficiencies are a contributing factor to this degradation mechanism. In this particular image, one can see an oil tank which was sectioned in half to, in order to expose the bottom and uh, the side. When there is water inside the tank, there is usually a water line formed inside, and this is clear evidence of water presence inside the tank. If the outlet port is located on the side and above the bottom, as seen on the right image, the water cannot be completely drained from the tank and will stay inside the tank and it eventually uh, led to favorable conditions for co corrosion to occur. In the right image, you can see the water line clearly distinguishable within the brown pattern. In the, in the slide. Oil spills are not necessarily associated with design issues. They are, could be associated with improper installations or uh, oftentimes maintenance issues. 
In this particular instance, although the tank is incorrectly sloped away from the outlet port, contrary to the regulations applicable at that time, the oil spill did not occur from internal corrosion, but rather occurred from defective uh, valve. Should the defective valve be replaced with a proper one, most likely the oil spill would have not occurred. But in this particular instance, the owner decided to patch the valve himself by wrapping it in tape and insulation form. Obviously, this improvisation did not last longer, and eventually the oil discharged uh, in the environment. In order to prevent sediments from the tank to travel to the furnace, oil tank installations are provided with inline filters located downstream from the outlet port. These filters are required by their manufacturers to be replaced at least once a year. For certain type of filters, this is done by unscrewing the cylinder canister from the lid and replacing the filter inside with a new one. Then the canister is screwed back onto the lid. In this particular case, the person who replaced the filter damaged the threads during reinstallation. This damage is called cross-threading, and in this particular case, uh, the threads do not fit in each other and cause damage to each other. They will be creating pathways for oil to discharge. There are instances when the associated washer with a filter is pinched or it's the wrong size. Such conditions could also lead to an oil spill. Now we are going back to uh, manufacturing defects. In this particular case, you are looking at an outlet port as seen from inside the tank. The outlet port is welded onto the shell of the tank. And you can see in this image, as highlighted by the red arrow, the weld was improperly made. There is a gap between the shell of the tank and the outlet port. That little gap allowed stagnant water to accumulate and eventually corroded the steel, uh, leading to an oil discharge into the environment. Oil tanks are made by welded steel plates. This image shows the end of the tank where the shell meets one of the, uh, the end faces. And what you see in the image is the so-called lap weld. The arrow points towards a defect into the weld where there is a gap between the two steel plates. And that gap collects water and sludge and prevents them from being drained out. And over time, the stagnant water would lead to internal corrosion of the tank. We have seen numerous cases where the oil spill was because of an installation issue. The code requires that the oil tank be installed on a solid foundation and to be prevented from falling ice or from toppling over. In this particular case, the oil tank was installed on two patio stones but with improper foundation. So over time, due to rain and ground settling, the front legs of the tank collapsed. And as a consequence, the tanks collapsed itself. And in the process, it fractured completely the outlet uh, valve. The gap formed due to a complete fracture of the valve, allow what, uh, oil to discharge in the environment. A somehow similar condition is shown in the next slide where one can see that the oil supply line from the outlet port consists of a steel pipe. Should the pipe would have been anchored properly, probably the valve would have not failed. Unfortunately, we don't know if the valve failed due to overload by falling ice or by someone stepping uh, accidentally on the valve. However, this installation should have been done according to the code. All spills occurred to the uh, accident as well. This image shows the bottom of the, an oil tank showing the location where an outlet valve was located. Just by looking at the fracture surface, one cannot tell why it failed. So we had to take the re reminder of the component and take it to a lab for further examination. This, the following images shows on the left a section of the fractured valve, and on the right side, an image taken under a powerful microscope showing features that allowed us to determine what caused the failure of the valve. In this particular case, the tank was located in an area with vehicular movement, and it was not protected from impact. Somehow, uh, during uh, snow cleaning, 
a chunk of ice was pushed laterally into the valve, causing it to, to fail. Accidents can happen to other components associated with an oil tank, such as this flare fitting fi uh, connection. This was connected downstream from an oil tank, and it connects the oil supply line to the inline filter. During a renovation project around the property, uh, some of the workers accidentally lifted the tank from the ground, and they did so by lifting it uh, by the oil supply line. Obviously, the oil supply line is not designed to withstand the weight of the oil tank, and it bent and it ruptured, and as a consequence, an oil spill occurred in an area which is highlighted by the red arrow in this image. As mentioned earlier, the regulations are very specific on how a tank should be installed. This is a typical example of regulations broken uh, in terms of installation of the tank. There is no foundation and the tank was not uh, prevented from toppling, it was not secured. And as a consequence, shortly after installation it uh, toppled over allowing a significant amount of oil to discharge in the environment. Maintenance issues are also a concern for some of the oil tanks. In this particular slide, we're presenting a case where it was external corrosion that led to an oil spill. This image shows one leg of the tank and the, the weld uh, associated with the underside of the tank. One can see significant corrosion activity around the weld. Luckily, we were able to attend the site before the tank was removed and it was found out that the tank was installed on top of a flower bed and the humidity caused external corrosion which eventually led to bottom wall perforation from the outside. Outside corrosion on other components other than the oil tank could also lead to oil spills. This image shows two saddles which are used to support oil tanks. You can see there is significant corrosion uh, and wall thinning on one of the two saddles and under this condition it was no longer capable to withstand the weight of the tank and the oil inside and as a consequence the tank toppled over allowing a significant oil to spill into the environment. We often inquire, uh, encounter oil spills associated with indoor oil storage tanks. When an indoor oil tank is filled by an oil supplier the oil supplier has practically no visual contact with the appliance while he pumps oil into the tank. He relies on a simple device installed on the tank and called vent whistle to stop the filling operation when the tank is full. However, if this device is not functioning properly, overfilling is usually occurring. How the name implies, it's how this device works. When the tank is filled to a certain level, the System, the device started to whistle and the operator is aware that she should stop. he should stop filling the tank. However, if the device is obstructed, like an in, in, insect's neck, sorry, like in this instance, the vent whistle will not prop, well, work properly. So in this particular instance, uh, the oil operator was not aware that the tank indoor was filled and he continued, continuously pumped oil until it flooded the basement. In this slide, one can see the insects that we retrieved from the previously shown vent uh, whistle. Some of the indoor oil tanks are supplied with oil through pipes that are partially buried underground. In this particular case, the oil spill was discovered many years after it initially started. This is because the corrosion of the field pipe occurred underground and it was not detectable. Moreover, an oil spill was discharged only when the tank was filled. During normal operations, there was no oil discharge. And this amount of oil discharging was not as significant to uh, raise a red flag. The oil spill was accidentally discovered when it was a, during a renovation project around the property when excavation exposed the water supply line. As you can see on the right side, the fill pipe is badly corroded from the inside and it has several perforations which allowed some of the oil to discharge during filling operations. 
in the past, underground storage tanks were acceptable, uh, at least in Ontario. However, as they are no longer accepted, most of them were abandoned on the property. The property exchange owners and new owners are not always aware of the existence of old and abandoned underground storage tanks that still contain residual oil. Over time, there is internal corrosion on these tanks which will allow a significant oil uh, to exit into the environment. We discussed earlier about inline filters. We presented a case involving uh, cross-threading. This is a, tip, a different tip, type of oil filter which caused an oil spill because it was improper installed. As you can see on the right side image, there is a gap between the lid and the canister. The, we concluded that the filter was improperly tightened and that existing gap allowed oil to escape. As mentioned earlier, inline filters are required by their manufacturers to be replaced at least once a year and preferably before the onset of freezing condition. Why is this required is because oil filters do not collect only sediments but also water from the tank and during cold weather that water can freeze and upon expansion it could cause the canister to crack or to separate from the lid. In this particular case uh, you can see on the left image the actual chunk of ice that was formed inside the filter and on the right image you can see the deformed filter alongside with a brand new filter. It's rare but it happens that oil spills are uh, caused by uh, unusual situation. In this particular case we had an oil that failed due to MIC which is microbiologically induced corrosion and uh, upon sectioning the tank we found it in very good condition except for an area, a very localized area which contains significant corrosion activity. Upon further examination and investigation, we determined it was a group of kids who wanted to see how the insects will survive inside the tank, and they pushed a number of bees inside the tank uh, using a rag and wooden sticks. These are a few of the objects that we found in this uh, particular uh, tank. After reviewing some of the potential causes that could lead to an oil spill and a few unusual situations, let's talk about do's and those don'ts in an oil spill investigation. Speaking of unusual uh, oil spills, somehow I forgot to mention a case involving an oil spill that contaminated a, a cemetery. The investigation was a nightmare as an archaeologist need to be employed and the descendants of the deceased needs to be tracked down and to give permission for the soil uh, testing. All spills are lengthy and very complex investigations and also they require the participation of a large number of parties including but not limited to insurance companies, adjusters, TSSA, oil suppliers, tank manufacturers, remediation companies, engineers retained by various involved parties, lawyers, etc. Therefore it is very important to know what to do and what not to do when involved in an oil spill. The homeowner is overwhelmed by the attention or is uncooperative with the investigation. Before we go into do's and don'ts, I want to speak to you as homeowners. So take uh, off your professional hat right now and put your homeowner hat on. By law, you must immediately report an oil spill if you cause or permit the release, had control of the substance just before the oil spill occurred, or you are, some, you are a member of a public agency and the spill hasn't been reported. The spill must be immediately reported to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Spills Action Center, the municipality, and the person in control of the substance if known and not already aware. So if you attend the site and the homeowner or the oil supplier did not not notify the Ministry of Environment, then the, be proactive and call the Spills Action Center and report the spill. As I mentioned earlier, make sure the Ministry of Environment has been notified of the incident. 
if the homeowner or the, spill or the oil supplier or any other person have not done this yet. Until the TSSA in Ontario attends the site, you are not allowed to change the site or remove the tank. However, you, you are free to take lots of pictures of the incident tank, fittings, pipes, other components, legs, underside, foundation, manufacturer label, including close-up views. It won't cost more to take pictures. Lots of pictures are really worth a lot of money because by the time engineers are assigned to this claim, the tank is already removed and the remediation action already started. We suggest to contact a forensic engineer specialized in oil spill to attend the scene as soon as possible before the site condition is changed by the cleanup crew. Seek advice on what document and what to preserve before the engineer attends the site. For an oil investigation, not necessarily from a technical point of view, but from a legal point of view, it's very important to retrieve relevant documents associated with the tank, installation of the tank, inspection of the tank, maintenance of the tank, and fuel oil history delivery. Usually these documents are available from the owner. So those were the do's of oil investigation. Now let's go through a few of don'ts. As mentioned earlier, don't tamper with or discard any evidence or change its position. Don't forget to document the fuel oil tank condition and position, including foundation and the surrounding environment. You'll never know what's around the tank. As mentioned earlier, it could be a flower bed, which is relevant for external corrosion. Don't forget to document chain of custody. Once the site is released by the TSSA, it is very unlikely the tank will be examined on site by all the parties involved. Therefore, until such an investigation is set, the tank will be eventually removed, secured during transportation to an off-site location or to an independent lab. It's important to document its condition, journey, and companies, including, if possible, people who handled the tank during its journey from the site to off-site or to an independent lab, so there will be no discussions about uh, spoliation of evidence. As mentioned earlier, for the insurance carrier and later for the law firm involved, it's important to Sorry, we just pressed mute unintentionally, guys. So let's just go back to the last slide. The last don't, sorry, Dina, if you don't mind just restating it. I apologize for this uh, technical error at my part. Uh, I, I think you missed this slide. It's uh, associated with don'ts in oil in spill investigations. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to retrieve relevant documents associated with the tank installation, inspection, maintenance, and fuel oil history delivery. They might not be necessarily important for a technical examination, but they are crucial for the insurance carrier and for the law firm who will be later handling the case. I'm uh, handing the microphone over to Adam to continue on steps to take at onset of the subrogation process. Thanks, Dino. <clears throat> So as I said, we're going to talk now about the steps to take at the onset of the subrogation process, which is my specialty. So as I always tell my clients, subrogation starts immediately after the loss, uh, and so you need to preserve whatever evidence you can. Uh, as Dean, you said, it's <clears throat> critical from both uh, the technical perspective and from the legal perspective. You want to document everything you can about the condition of the tank at the time of its failure, details of the installation, condition inside and out, uh, and it's a... <clears throat> It's especially important to identify any deficiencies with the tank or its installation, regardless of whether or not it's the cause of the leak. And we'll get to the details of why that's important a little bit later. Um, so some of the critical documents to obtain, there's a comprehensive inspection from the installation of the tank. This needs to be filled out by whatever contractor installs the tank and it's provided to fuel oil suppliers. 
You also want records of all the fuel oil deliveries so we can identify who delivered fuel oil and when. The contracts and invoices from the tank installer so we can identify who it is and all the details about that. <clears throat> and contracts and invoices from all the maintenance on the tank and the heating system. Uh, now before we uh, continue, I'd like to ask you all a quick question with respect to dealing with these remediations. It should be popping up on your screen shortly. Um, have you ever employed an independent engineer to oversee a fuel oil remediation? We'll give you a, a few seconds just to input your answers before we speak about them. Okay, so according to the results, 61% of you said yes and 39% no. Uh, actually surprising because most of the litigation we deal with, the answer has typically been no, so this is a good sign. So at the outset of the subrogation process, we want to preserve the ability to recover. Just because your remediation is done successfully and that you documented everything correctly, it doesn't mean that you'll recover all that money. The aim is to take as many steps at the front end of the loss process to try and ensure that you're able to recover as much as possible at the subrogation stage. <clears throat> so it's important to hire an independent party to review the remediation plan and the execution as it's going on rather than leaving that to the legal side at the end of the day. Um, and the Thornhill case that I've highlighted here is one where the court has uh, specifically commented on that. In that case, the trial judge was highly critical of uh, DL Services, who's a well-known remediation contractor, for performing some excessive work and venturing outside of their initial budget. Uh, in fact, the trial judge dis uh, described it as orders of magnitude outside of the budget. Uh, DLS was criticized for specifically excavating to levels well below where their sampling data showed the presence of oil, and for waiting a matter of months before they commenced excavation, uh, as well as incurring excessive dumping fees. Um, and while it was DLS in that particular case, their actions aren't really that unusual when you compare it to other remediation contractors. So it's something that we want to be aware of to deal with immediately. Uh, and I'm finding, in fact, uh, personally, that more and more of the subrogation matters are involving exchanges of expert reports, which criticize and defend the remediation work that's performed and the cost of it, all with the aim of trying to reduce that recoverable amount. So. At the end of the day, it will cost less to have an independent qualified engineer on the ground directing the remediation and reporting on it than it will to face the prospect of reductions in the, remedi the remediation cost during the subrogation process. And as we know, during the subrogation process, there's nothing else we can do about it. It's already all been done. <clears throat> so in a recent case I actually dealt with, the subrogating insurer spent approximately $800,000 on remediation, which including Jack included jacking up a house worth approximately 100,000 to excavate the soil. At the pretrial conference, the, the, trial ju the judge was highly critical of the decision to save the house rather than demolish it. Uh, he considered that it would have been a much less expensive option to just pay out the insured uh, and demolish the house and then just do a, a regular old remediation rather than to jack up the house. So at an early stage, we want to get a comprehensive expert report in order to support our subrogation efforts. Um, but to maximize the potential, we want to focus on a few things. Now, the cause of the failure, I mean, we all know we want to identify that, and that is typically what the experts are, are instructed to do. But <clears throat> it is just as important to identify other code violations that may have been present in the tank and the heating system at the time. Other code violations can lead to liabilities against parties who may have seen those deficiencies or ought to have seen them and who should have taken steps to have them dealt with. So if they had dealt with them properly, the logic is that tank would have been removed from service and it wouldn't have been able to leak. So even if that violation that would cause it to be taken out of service didn't actually cause the leak, it may still lead to some liability. Now let's talk about some litigation strategies for these cases. So to consider the potential subrogation targets in any matter, we need to ask ourselves three questions. Who caused the loss? Who could have prevented the loss from occurring? And who could have made the loss less severe? Now from a liability perspective, the first class of defendants will have the most exposure, but the second and third classes still have some exposure. And this is important because sometimes in fuel oil cases, we don't have anybody in the first class. So we have to take who we have. 
Now, the expert report that we discussed earlier is especially critical to prove liability as against these classes of parties. Uh, in the first class, if the tank was installed improperly, you'll have the installer. Uh, if maintenance wasn't properly performed, you'll have the maintenance contractor in this category as well. Uh, or if somebody physically damaged the tank, they'll end up here as well. But in the second class, you'll have other qualified parties who should have identified deficiencies and taken the tank out of service. This can include the fuel oil delivery company as well as any other maintenance contractors who were on site, even if they weren't specifically required to work under the tank. Under the fuel oil regulation, if a qualified party sees a code violation, they have to tag the tank out as either an immediate or a non-immediate hazard. The tag out precludes further deliveries of fuel oil after the time uh, for rectifying the violation has gone by. With most steel tanks, the only real remedy is the replacement of the tank. So think about this situation. Exterior corrosion on, a, on an external tank, typically, i.e. surface rust, is considered a code violation. It has nothing to do with microbial-induced corrosion, and it's usually a non-immediate hazard, which is just worthy of a 90-day tag. But if a fuel oil delivery contractor fails to issue that tag and the tank subsequently leaks, they can still be liable for that. Now, some of the best results I've been able to achieve on subrogation matters, and this is fuel oil and beyond, occurred when we were retained by the insurer exceptionally early in the game. Uh, in fact, sometimes we've been retained on the day of certain large losses. Counsel are sometimes alive to issues that aren't considered by the adjusters and the contractors, and where such issues arise, it's best to deal with them early. This could be as simple as pointing out concerns that the defendants might have with the remediation process at the time, rather than criticizing it later down the road, or guiding the expert as to what elements they should be covering in their report. Uh, now, the best expert reports I've received are ones that are prepared after there's some discussion between counsel and the expert. Obviously, as counsel, I'm not going to tell the expert what to say, and I really don't want him to listen to me on that front. I want him to, to give me his honest opinion. But if I want them to comment on certain matters that they hadn't considered, uh, I, as I said, such as the other code violations which did, which did not directly cause the leak, or whether contractors should have seen them, it's best to raise them at this stage. That way we capture everything in a single report. We don't have to generate multiple reports throughout the process. Um, and when these investigations into subrogation are carried out early, it often happens that liability issues can be sorted out uh, from our perspective really prior to the remediation actually being completed. In that case, we can get comprehensive reports, we can be prepared to hit the ground running once that first party claim is completed, so we can just issue claims immediately and we don't have a waiting process. We can also put parties on notice a lot earlier, just on all of this drives us closer to settlement at an early stage. Uh, another thing to think about, no subrogation case is perfect, so it's important to engage counsel who are not going to sugarcoat the merits. If your case has some weaknesses, you want to know them early and so you can properly take them into account and you can set your settlement expectations appropriately. Um, it's very, very common for insureds and homeowners not to arrange for proper maintenance of the tanks. Since 2007, annual maintenance has been required on fuel oil tanks and it's the homeowner's job to make sure it gets done. When they fail to arrange for this maintenance, you're likely to face a significant contributory negligence for any fuel oil leak. Um, if the remediation costs are excessive or there's no independent oversight, it's best to consider what should or should not have been done at the outset of the case rather than waiting till down the line. Uh, and sometimes there's other contractual clauses. There may be hold harmless clauses, limitations of liabilities, or waivers of subrogation. Uh, these will preclude recovery as against parties who would otherwise be liable or can otherwise just reduce the value of the claim by creating more risk. Uh, some of these clauses are easier to identify than others, which is another reason why you should just engage counsel early. You can send them the contracts. They can look at it. Um, as an example, in a recent matter I've dealt with, we had a remediation cost which were about $800,000, but due to the fact that remediation costs were excessive when I saw the file, we deducted $200,000 and we applied a 50% contributory negligence due to the insured's action. And while this led to an, an opening offer of less than half of the value of the claim, it actually took us probably much closer to settlement. We probably cut months off the potential action because we didn't approach it from an unreasonable perspective at the outset. And finally, uh, one of the major ways that our office in particular has been able to facilitate some much earlier resolutions of files is to work together with the opposing counsel to make it easier for them to, to give us an offer. And this involves front-loading files with work so that all of our information and documentation can be produced immediately upon service of the claim. 
This includes all the expert reports. We don't like to hold those back uh, because we find it's really not beneficial. And by giving them that documentation allows the initial investigation performed by those defending adjusters mm -hmm. to consider not just their position but ours as well. In addition, rather than demanding defenses, we typically try and engage in some discussions with the parties to get their various positions and we can then identify the weaknesses to their positions and to ours. Uh, this leads to an exchange of information and documentation so everybody understands where we're all coming from and this will lead to settlement discussions rather than just diving into a discovery process. Now even if settlement is not available, at, not possible at the outset, we can try and also use the litigation process in a way that leads to resolution rather than just marching directly to trial. Uh, we can do this with some limited examinations for discoveries, we can do hot tubbing with experts, uh, or some early mediations as uh, potential options. So now I'm going to hand it back to George. All right, thank you very much, Adam and Dino. So this will take us to our questions portion, the Q&A. So please submit your questions. I do see that we've received plenty of them. So let's start with the first one. All right, so a few, have asked, a few of you guys have asked uh, if we could share the PowerPoint slides after the presentation. Um, we may have to modify some of the photos and stuff when we post it, but uh, yeah, absolutely, we'll, we'll be sure to share that and post it on our website. We'll send you guys an email when, when those things have been posted and you could uh, uh, share it uh, with your colleagues. A question here. Uh, do all tanks have an inline filter and is it mandatory to have the filter replaced annually on all tanks? Or, uh, on all tanks, thank you. Uh, I think, Dinu, that's an appropriate question for you. Thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is yes, all, the, all tank installations have to be provided with an inline filter. It's not necessarily the code requirement to replace the filter annually, but it's the manufacturer recommendations. So the answer to the second question of yours is yes, the oil needs to be replaced annually. Great, thank you. All right, next question. Are side outlet tanks better in the sense that they prevent freezing of the valve because the water in the tank generally doesn't sit inside the outlet valve like it does in a bottom outlet? That's a question for Dinu, I'm assuming. Uh, many years ago, the industry recognized the design deficiency associated with the providing the outlet port on the side. The location on the side prevented the water from being drained out. Uh, the water does not necessarily sit in the valve, it sits in the oil filter, so uh, I, I think uh, the best design is the one <coughs> adopted with the outlet port at the bottom. I hope this answered your, your question. Great, okay. I've got another question here, it says, what was the name of the court case? Thornhill versus, question, question, question mark, uh, that would be for Adam. It says lift in, regarding lift in the house, lifting the house rather than demolishing. Uh, uh, let me just pull up that slide. Uh, no, I mean I know what you're talking about. The lifting the house rather than demolishing is not actually a published case because it's still ongoing. So that's one of my own ones. The case I referenced is uh, Thornhill and Highland Fuels. It's a 2014 trial decision. I think the citation is in one of the slides there. I don't recall it off the top of my head. Uh, but that was that was actually a fairly standard uh, exterior tank which had leaked. Uh, the major criticism in that case was with respect to the remediation process, and there was some uh, there was a quite a bit of other discussion involved in it relating to what is the proper foundation required by the code. Okay, I've got another question here for Adam. It says, um, "I lost it. Give me a quick sec." Has, legisl has legislation come into play now in Ontario for double wall tanks at this point? Do either of you guys know that? Uh, yeah, the requirement in Ontario is for, I believe, external tanks have to have some sort of double bottom or secondary containment. It doesn't have to be a complete double wall completely surrounding the tank. 
but it has to at least uh, cover the bottom and have a leak detection system in between those. Now there's been no requirement to remove and replace old tanks. This is just for new tanks installed. Great. All right, I see another question here. How often should comprehensive inspections take place? Are oil suppliers required to do any inspection of an outdoor tank prior to filling it? And that's from uh, Shane Sinyard from Allstate Insurance. Thanks for coming out, Shane. Uh, I guess that's for either of you. Okay. Um, uh, by, per the code, the comprehensive inspection has to be performed every 10 years. And a fuel oil supplier cannot fill the tank without having that inspection. Uh, the day-to-day -day expectation on a fuel oil supplier is that they will perform sort of a cursory visual inspection of the tank prior to filling it, just to make sure there's nothing really obviously wrong with it. They don't have to do any detailed inspection. They don't need to look inside it or anything like that. It's really just cursory to make sure it's not leaking and there's nothing obviously wrong with it. Great. Thank you. Another question here, it seems like it's for, uh, for Adam again. Uh, can Adam clarify the meaning of independent engineer? Is this the same as the QP required to oversee the... Uh, another person also had asked, can you define independent? Well, see, what we usually find with the remediation process is there's no third-party engineer who's involved. The remediation contractor is is there, and there's somebody who is there's another there's another qualified person who has to submit a port a report to TSSA, but they're not guiding the remediation process typically. They're usually just reporting on it, and so that's why we're saying it could be the same person who is doing that if they're qualified to do that. Um, but it also isn't a bad idea to have another engineer out there, completely separate to guide the process. Because then, you, as long as you're eliminating uh, any suggestion of collusion between these parties, it's going to make your, your case hold up a little better. All right, I've got another question. What's the average life expectation of a tank? That's a very good question, and there are so many factors in, involved in the uh, life uh, of an oil tank that uh, this answer cannot be precisely answered. Uh, usually, if the tank is properly maintained, it is fair to say that it should stand uh, service for about 10 years. Okay. I've got another question here. What obligation do adjusters have, if any, to report a spill that, insure, that an insured does not want to report and where no coverage is applicable? That's an interesting question. I, I could answer the first part of the question and let Adam answer the second one. An oil spill, spill needs to be reco reported regardless uh, the, the owner wishes. Is the, is the law that requires an oil spill to be reported to appropriate authorities. And as mentioned in one of my slides earlier, uh, it's not only the owner, it's also the person who noticed the oil spill that needs to notify the authorities. Uh, sorry. So... I mean, I think that covers it. I mean, I, I agree. There, there's an obligation to report the spill, regardless of whether the owner wants to deal with it. Um, and that it, it, all it takes, in, in Ontario at least, it's a quick phone call to the Spills Action Centre to report it. And then either the Ministry of the Environment or the TSSA will follow up. There's another question here. It says, you mentioned that a tank was set on two patio slabs. I understand that in Ontario, the tank is to be set on one slab. Is my understanding correct? The installation of an oil tank on two patio slab is it's a bad installation uh, as it can lead to uneven settlement of the tank. Uh, to answer your question, yes, you are correct. The tank should be installed on a concrete slab on solid foundation. So I guess the two slabs caused the... the, the Uneven settling of the yeah. tank. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Does a spill have to be notified regardless of the potential size of the spill? In Ontario, an oil spill needs to be reported to appropriate authorities only if the amount that leaked exceeds 25 liters. Um, actually, that's not correct. So there, there's, a, I know what you mean, 
So according to TSSA in Ontario, they distinguish between a spill and a leak. For a spill, DNU is correct. A spill needs to be reported over 25 liters, but a spill is defined as something that is caused by human error. So if you knock over a gasoline canister or something like that, that's a spill. A mechanical failure of a tank, TSSA classes as a leak, and all leaks need to be reported to the Spills Action Center. Thanks for the correction, Adam. This is very useful for all the engineers involved in uh, oil spills. Great. I'll take one more question, or a couple more, because we've got a ton of questions here. Thank you guys for submitting all these questions. Is there a requirement to remove a fuel tank after a certain number of years? Um, for an above-ground fuel tank, there's no obligation to remove it after a certain number of years, as long as it remains in good condition. Uh, and it's, as long as there's no code violations, there's nothing wrong with that. Commercial tanks, so like underground tanks and gas stations, there's a very different regime in place. Uh, and underground tanks generally are, uh, I think, are required to be replaced after a certain amount of time. But your standard above-ground tank, no. As long as it works fine, it can stay there. This is an interesting one. Do you have any specific advice for spill response strategies in extremely cold environments? Do either of you guys have any advice? Bundle up, I, I would probably say. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to be honest, and uh, we haven't been involved in an oil spill up north, so honestly, I cannot provide an, an answer to your question. But uh, thanks for posing it. And if you wish, we can uh, do some uh, research and we'll get back to you via email. Yes. So uh, the gentleman that submitted that question, I will do a little bit of research and and uh, speak with Adam and Dinu about it and get back to you on it for sure after this. Now, a bunch of other people have submitted questions. Thank you so much uh, for, for submitting the questions. The ones that we have not actually responded to, we will send you an email within the next day or two. Uh, individually and making sure that we get to all of your questions. Um, I just want to very quickly go over uh, who Origin and Cause is and who McCaig Borlack is. So very quickly, McCaig Borlack has been established for over 20 years. Um, you know, Adam, you could just jump in quickly. Okay. Uh, McCaig Borlack, we were in 1994. We've grown to 60 lawyers now in three offices in Ontario. We're focused on working primarily for insurers. Uh, we deal with subrogation matters as well as a number of practice areas. Uh, we have the largest subrogation practice group in Ontario. We've got more than 40 lawyers who handle subrogation files throughout all the offices. And about 10 of those lawyers, including myself, are completely dedicated to subrogation with more than 90% of their practices devoted to it. Uh, and we're also the Ontario member of the Canadian Litigation Council, which is a network of firms across Canada who can provide the highest quality services to insurers uh, in every province and territory in the country. Great. Thanks, Adam. So origin and cause, very quickly, we've been established 25 years ago. It's actually our 25th anniversary uh, this year. We're the largest forensic engineering and fire investigation firm in Canada with 11 locations and over 35 experts. We have offices in Ancaster, Mississauga, Kingston, Ottawa, Sudbury, London, Windsor. We have an office in Halifax, Winnipeg, Calgary, and we just opened up an office in Edmonton, which uh, we've been getting amazing reviews uh, from the local market. The services that we have in-house, we have fire and explosion investigation. We have a canine unit that focuses on uh, the use of accelerants uh, on scenes, which has been an incredible tool that we use in our investigations. We have a structural engineering unit, electrical engineering unit. Uh, within the electrical engineering unit, there's a subspecialty of alarm system analysis. You can see uh, Mazen Habash, who's the president of Origin and Cause, looking at a, a panel there. We have a mechanical engineering group, uh, and uh, within the mechanical engineering group, we have uh, an event data recorder analysis service. So, you know, the black boxes and vehicles and heavy equipment uh, and heavy trucks and, and so on, we're able to extract the data from them to really find out what exactly happened at a scene. We also have a materials and metallurgical engineering uh, team. You could see in this photo, that's Dinu uh, looking at a gear clamp. And we have chemical engineering services as well. And lastly, we have a forensic litigation service, which we are uh, the industry leaders when it comes to forensic litigation experience. We've been involved in over 1,500 legal cases. We've been qualified as experts in all levels and types of Canadian uh, courts. 
We've testified as expert witnesses in over 170 litigation proceedings in Canada, the United States, and internationally. And there's a breakdown just of, it, of you know, the types of uh, times that we've actually uh, been expert witnesses in litigation. I encourage you all to check out our website. We've got some great resources. It's origin-and-cause.com. You can see here, I've, I've shown you all the like, articles that we push out uh, on a monthly basis. You see this one right here, that's Dinu, and uh, this was an amazing article we got great feedback about. It's the five common myths about consumer product failures everyone needs to know about. So I encourage you guys to go check those out. They're very useful. They're, they're short and easy to understand, but they're practical. They're, they're designed so that you can read it for like three minutes or so and then get back to work and directly implement it into your work. And lastly, I'm very excited to announce our next webinar, which is taking place June 15th. And we're really excited about it because it's a different, a different way of doing uh, uh, webinars for us. The title is In the Lab with Origin and Cause, Destructive Testing. So we're going behind the scenes with forensic engineer Mazen Habash, and he's going to be con uh, conducting a destructive test on a stove that was involved in a fire. So we're actually going to have like a video instead of just slides of Mazin in a lab and he's going to crack open a, a stove and show you guys how engineers uh, methodically look at all of the evidence, the physical evidence, in order for them to determine what their technical opinion is. A lot of times you guys give us a call and say, hey guys, I had this fire and uh, please go out and take a look at it. And then, you know, a few days later we'll provide you with a report with our opinion. Well, this is just to show you guys behind the scenes what we do in the lab and we've received a lot of feedback from insure, from from our clients trying to find out what exactly we do and what our process is so we're very happy to to explain this to you we're going to learn you're going to learn through the destructive testing things like you know how we test for manufacturing defects or how we see manufacturers defects or design deficiencies or if the product was misused or abused or if there was an installation error or so on so um, this is a, a really cool topic we're gonna try out with the with the the video format and uh, I encourage you guys to to sign up so the way to do that is once you guys close this webinar page there's going to be a quick questionnaire that pops up. I think it's five or six questions, and they're all kind of multiple choice. It'll probably take you 10 seconds to fill out. And one of the questions will be, would you like us to sign you up to the next webinar? So you could just, if you wish to join, just hit yes, and we'll make sure to get you signed up. And of course, if whatever for whatever reason your schedule changes and you can't attend, that's no problem at all, but at least you got, uh, at least you got your place secured in it. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We just went over by a few minutes, so I do apologize for that. Uh, thank you again, and have a great day.